Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 195 for Monday, December 31st. Happy New Year 2018. folks and welcome to gig gab the podcast by for and about working musicians a sponsor for this episode is expressvpn we're ex- at expressvpn.com slash gig gab you get three months free with your one-year subscription we'll talk more about that in a minute here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in las gatas california it's paul kent how you doing mr kent fantastic mr hamilton we're here the last day of 2018. By the way, do we celebrate New Year's Eve 2018 or New Year's Eve 2019? Is is the celebration of the New Year's Eve for the following year or is it New Year's Eve 2018? I, I think this is the 2019 because everybody's going to have hats tonight that say 2019, not 2018. Yeah. Right. I think we're yeah. celebrating the year to come. But like we're ringing in the new year as opposed to, uh, I mean, I suppose that, but you know, simultaneously we're saying goodbye to the old one. It's just how it goes. It, it's how it goes for us humans because our minds are so feeble that we have to perceive time in a linear fashion. <laughs> I, I don't think that's actually the don't way time my, is. Don't diss my fellow humans, Dave. <laughs> Oh, I'm amongst you. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's how it goes. But our minds are too feeble to perceive time as it actually exists. So uh, we choose to, to uh, you know, we, we all agree to to say that it's a linear thing. But it really, that's that's obviously not the truth. But, you know, I guess I, actually the, the party itself is all about getting to midnight, which starts 2019. It happens to start in 2018. But the party itself is yeah. about 2019. That that's makes right. sense. Yeah, yeah that yeah. makes sense. I guess. Well, that's cool. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Are you playing a gig tonight? No, I think I shared with you before. This oh, is the first right. New Year's Eve in, in, in a while because the NCAA championships are in my area and they've kind of taken up all the oxygen in all the hotels. So the, the big hotel gig that we've had uh, three of the last four years um, got bought out by the NCAA. And so uh, and I don't know what they're doing for music. I couldn't sure. find out. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so, how about you? Oh, yeah. You know, I I don't like New Year's Eve gigs. Um, <laughs> well, they, you know, it's amateur night, right? It, everybody comes out, even the people that never come out, and uh, and then driving home is always questionable and all of that stuff. But you got to uh, do it in a hotel. That that's just the only way to do it, right? Well, I'm not. I'm. I have two gigs tonight, if you can believe that. I have the final performance, at least of this run, of Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Yes, the show that I declined, and then they came back, and they begged, and they changed the I'm, money. I'm guessing you didn't better. do a very good job of declining. You know, I think I did a really good job of declining. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, did a, I did a good enough job that they understood that it was a no, and then and, and it, it actually worked out, because it really, part of it was the money thing, simply, not, not that... I am fortunate enough that I don't have to do this for money, but I know that there are many people that do. And so, and also my time is important to me. So if I'm going to spend it somewhere, I want to get paid. Uh, but I also know there's other people that do do it for money and, and I can't be party just, I mean, we've been doing this four years almost, right. Where we've been saying you gotta, you gotta get enough because other people need it, even if you don't or whatever, right. You know, you gotta get a fair wage. And so that was part of it. But the other part was I simply didn't have time in, in December to do all those rehearsals that they wanted me to do. And so I said, no, and I didn't do any of those rehearsals. And then they came back and said, so, uh, we don't have a drummer and, uh, and, and so I said, OK, well, now I don't have to do those rehearsals and I don't even have to stress about not doing those rehearsals because that time has passed. Again, reference the beginning of the show. where We talked about the linearity of it all. And uh, and so that's, um, you know, so it's so it all worked out. And the show has been a total blast. It's um, it's really fun. I didn't quite understand. I knew the show would be fun. But I didn't quite understand how much fun it would be. Um, this show called The Hedwig and the Angry Inch. It's it's actually a lot like Brechtones, the show I the did. The music is fun or the cast is fun or you know, what's making it fun? Yeah. So it's all rock and roll. It's it's, you know, kind of in that 80s rock vibe. I mean, it's it's original music that was written for this show when it when it was created in the 90s. But um, 
but the the music's really fun and we get to play, you know, full volume. It's not like a theater show where we have to, you know, be reserved or anything. In fact, we're a rock band on stage and and we are supposed to play like a rock band and the singers are on handheld mics and all that stuff. So the the music's really fun, but the show is a lot like this Brechtone show that I did with my friend Billy back in October and I didn't realize that. It's it's about the lead singer of a band. Uh, and the, the, the show is happening in the theater that it's happening in. So there's, it's not really theater. I mean, it is, but it's not. It's like anti-theater. And uh, and it's basically the, the singer telling um, her story, his story. It depends on how you want to classify this person, but it, it, generally her story um, about, uh, you, you know, her, her life. And, and then songs are part of that. But a large part of the show is, is just Hedwig monologuing and, and kind of telling this story and interacting and all that stuff. So it's fun. Uh, it's good. a yeah, it's it's been and good. They actually have a New Year's Eve performance, huh? So, yeah, we have a performance at 9 p.m. tonight um, and then and that'll be the final final performance of this run. I think we're going to wind up doing another weekend um, not to in the not too distant future, but I can't really talk about when and where. But um, but I think the run will be reprised because people are loving it. It's been selling out all the time. And um, and then at midnight. We do as we did on Christmas night at midnight tonight at midnight, we will do a performance of Rocky Horror. So mm. two gigs, same theater. But, you know, then I have to pack up same my drums. Band for both things. No, uh, I'm obviously the same. And one of our the head, the Hedwig band has two guitar players, bass, keys, drums. And the Rocky band has just guitar, bass, keys, drums, just a four piece. And so that one of the guitar players and me is the same for both bands. Then the piano player changes and the bass player changes. So, but they're both really good bands. I mean, it's been super fun. That's playing. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, especially this Hedwig band because we've been playing the show every night, you know, for the last four nights or whatever. So we've got and the and the songs are. I basically have the show memorized, you know, which is great because I can just play, which mm -hmm. is which is great. It's fun and it's it's just straight ahead rock and roll. So it's it's easy. All right, well, man. Yep. So, given okay. given this little dissertation, I was thinking a good thing to do for our last show of 2018, even though it'll be shared in 2019. Um, look back over the year and let's talk about some lessons that we learned. Maybe some New Year's resolutions. All right. Sure. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'll go first with a with a lesson learned. You don't get points for being cute. Yeah. So we've talked about this in many different ways over the years. And I think we've amplified it a couple of times this time. It's like, as you go out and you pick your cover tunes that you're going to play and this message to my fellow cover band musicians, finding that real obscure song that will connect to two people. And at the cost of the other X amount of people in the audience and possibly at the cost of, you know, the people in your band who are not, who are not along for the ride on the cuteness it might be too high a cost to pay. Yeah. So, you know, finding that obscure things that, you know, and remember there's a million zillion songs out there. There's a, there've been a lot of number one songs, you know, we tend to gravitate in the cover world to, to a couple of trusted tried and true ones, but there are a lot of songs that are very familiar to play and that you can go and find, you know, of the various charts that billboard keeps. Um, but, you know, finding that one obscure one, you know, side four track 16 you know uh, of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, of something that y you know you you really feel the desire to to prove your exercise in being right and how deep your musical knowledge is often often is probably not worth worth the the toll yeah or the time it, well, it's one of those things where the exception proves the rule. You, you like I, I as you're saying that I can even think of one and I'm totally on the on, on the page with you. I mean, if anybody that's listened even just for the last couple of weeks knows that I'm right there with you. But uh, I can I can think of exceptions to that rule. Doesn't mean the rule doesn't isn't good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, there are those songs that your band might just kill. And if you can kill them and deliver them. Great. But my feeling on that is. Why bother trying to find those written by other people, especially for me being in a band where there's, uh, you know, some great songwriters. It's like, let's just write our own songs that we can kill. And it's, it's literally the same thing. And the crowd didn't know it walking in. So we might as well make it ours, not some obscure one that nobody cares about other than maybe one guy in the band. Yeah. 
There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I suppose I'll start with the obvious one, and that is uh, the devil is in the details. Read the contracts, right? I've I've had this fall two uh, very important reminders in that lesson. The one with UNH where the deal changed at the last minute, even though we had had the thing in place for six months when the contract arrived, it was different. And I should have walked away and I didn't. And it caused me a great deal of headache uh, and probably burned a, a bridge that didn't need to be burned. But, uh, you know, that's how life goes. So uh, anytime anybody and then and then this thing with the with the rep, with the headwig that we talked about as well, that one actually worked out really well in the end, as I, as evidenced by my enthusiasm here. But I but that one I had learned a lesson from. And when the contract arrived, it was like, oh, whoa, 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 this is not what I signed up for. No. And and I held my ground and 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 obviously it, it they understood that they respected that they changed things and and here we are, so uh, so that's definitely a lesson that I've learned this year is uh, especially for the you know for gigs where a contract is involved and really there's always a contract involved it may not be written on a piece of paper that says contract or agreement at the top but those things where the details when the details are shared that's a contract right you, you know in in contract law even an email even a handshake as long as you've got performance based on it uh, is a contract right so when the details are shared pay attention to them and get them clear like clarify the details don't just say oh yeah cool we'll play the club at nine o'clock how much for how long how many breaks yeah. do we get right like ask those questions everybody's okay with it or everybody should be. And if somebody's not, there's your red flag, right? You know, if you start asking questions, not like, I mean, reasonable questions like those, how much are we getting paid? What time do we start? What time do we end? How many breaks, you know, or, or whatever, how many rehearsals? Band get a meal. That's a band do get I get a meal? Uh, right. Drink, drink tickets. Yeah. These are okay questions to ask. Exactly. And, and if someone doesn't want to talk about the details, um, then you don't have a gig yet. That that's really the lesson I've learned. If it, until the details are discussed, there's no gig. You're just talking about it conceptually, and that's okay too. Like that's how deals form. You start talking in concept, and then okay, let's put it together. And and when you put it together, if the deals aren't, if the details aren't what you want, it's okay to say no. But you yeah. know, do it respectfully if possible. Uh, you know, try not to burn a bridge if possible. But you know, that's how it goes. It's okay to say Got no. It. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, re related to that, another reflection is um, you as a working musician who's taking money in some way or form, you are, whether you like it or not, you are part of a fraternity of musicians. And um, you, one of your tasks in this world is to uphold the fair value for musical services. All the hours that you've taken learning your craft, perfecting your craft, buying your gear, giving lessons, taking lessons, going to gigs, driving to gigs, paying car insurance, paying gas, all that type of stuff is real money. And, you know, to, to uh, just uh, say, Hey, I've got some buddies. We'll do it for free is in, in a venue that, you know, is part of the musical ecosystem, wherever you live, that's kind of a slap to the other people in your ecosystem. And so it's, I think it's just really important. Even if you're a weekend warrior, especially if you're a weekend warrior, well, yeah, especially. I mean, it doesn't really cross the mind because if you're if you if your head if your mindset is in, you know, there's a fair value for for what right. I do. And again, th th this means a lot of things to a lot of people in a lot of ways. It doesn't mean you you should never do a charity gig if everybody's doing a charity gig. You know, right? It, yeah. There's but, nothing but wrong with a with a free gig where there's a problem is if it's a for profit scenario and you choose to devalue. Your part in that, that's where it's, that's where there's an issue. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, from talking to people and seeing the notes that we get and talking to other friends who are musicians, it seems like scale is, you know, fairly, fairly consistent across the country, right? Yeah. A hundred bucks yeah. a man is kind of a minimum, you know, 200 bucks a man is a good night. Corporate work, 300 bucks a man is a good night. Uh, solo work, 100 to 150 person, you know, plus tips. You know, it seems yep. like somewhere in there is kind of still scale. Yeah. As my good the friend Doug Booth. same scale it's been since the 80s, by the way. That is exactly what, well, the 70s, my friend. I just had, <laughs> I just had uh, I a, a holiday cocktail with a, with a buddy of mine who I went to high school with over the holidays. And, um, and we were lamenting the fact that, you know, in the 70s, uh, you, you actually could buy a house on your on your wages as a part-time as a, as a 
musician, not part-time musician, but, you know, five, six nights a week playing clubs in your town, you actually made enough, you know, to, to subsist on. And now it's so far from that. It's a joke, but, but, um, the, the point being that, um, saying I can do it for free or, you know, just because you want the gig, because you, you know, want to express your, your creativeness, your, your, you know, get your, get your yaya's out, you know, by performing there's, it's a little bit more complicated than that in a world that's fighting to keep live music alive. Because remember a lot of people who do that, their chops are not good enough to warrant asking for money. And that just muddies, muddies the world even further. So, totally. You know, place value for everything that's gone into you doing it. It is a privilege and a joy to be able to do what we do, but it has value. You have to believe it has value. Well, look uh, at look at the thing that you're doing. Right. I mean, if you're somewhere that is, you know, like a bar that's making that's in the business to be in business and make money and they're having you play. Okay, well, you are part of that now, you know, and and hopefully you're able to add to that. And if you're not, then you shouldn't like if you don't see yourself adding value to that, don't do it for free. Just don't do it until yeah. you can see yourself adding value. And a lot of that's in your head, right? You know, we like like you said, Paul, we all love to play. We do this because we love it. We joke amongst ourselves that we would do it for free. And sometimes we say, oh, we play the gig for free, but we, you know, schlep our gear. That's the part we get paid for. No, no, you get paid for the whole thing, right? You know, that's the reality of it. Because if you say that too much, then somebody will say, oh, cool, I'll set up a back line. You guys come and play and you'll do it for free. Well, that's not quite what we meant, you know. Yeah. yeah. And again, I've gotten a lot of backlash about this. People saying, well, you don't tell me, you know, what I can charge for my service. If I put my time in and I've gotten my craft, you know, and I want to give it away, I can do that. And I've actually gotten quite a bit of grief, you know, local musicians around, have, you know, certainly spoke up. And that I still stand by this as a principle that yeah. um, there are there are people who um, this is how they make their living, you yep. know, their, their choice. And, um, you know, like if anything, if, if a plumber was giving away his plumbing services for free, there would be, you know, a significant amount of outrage yes. amongst plumbers. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and just you know, because, other- you know, I know you and I, I mean, at, at, at different levels we're you know, we're it, we have uh, we have other sources of primary income, as many of our listeners do. And so we we could we could theoretically afford to do this for free. It doesn't mean the money isn't valuable to us. A hundred bucks is a hundred bucks. You know, like if I don't have to visit an ATM to get cash for whatever meal out or, you know, beer money or whatever, like that's valuable to me. It's like I, I appreciate the money that I get from these gigs for sure. But you but you also are intensely cognizant of the amount of time you've put in to give somebody something of value for that hundred bucks. Right. Heck that yeah. amount of time you have woodshedded and practiced and, you know, called for, you know, tried to get gigs, all yeah. the things that go into it. Yeah. There's a real true cost. So so place a fair value on your cost. Recognize you are part of this uh, this giant fraternity sorority of local musicians and uh you know uh i would say relish that membership in that club i mean if you've gotten to the point where you're part of a music scene and you're out there competing for gigs you know bidding for gigs applying for gigs calling for gigs you know that's cool you that means you've gotten to that point where you think you have a product that's of it value it and and keep running with it yep Hey, I want to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor, which is ExpressVPN. And as I said at the beginning of the show, if you visit expressvpn.com slash giggab, that's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash giggab with three G's, two in the middle and one at the beginning, uh, (laughs) you get three months free with your one year subscription. And here's the thing, folks, you're a working musician. You're out there in clubs. And, and, you know, maybe next door at the coffee shop, wherever you are, you're connecting to Wi-Fi. Let's put it this way. Bar owners barely understand how to run the sound equipment that they own. I guarantee you 99 percent of them aren't running the most secure routers that they possibly could. Most of them leave their Wi-Fi completely open with no password. That means anybody can sniff your traffic. Right. This is not a good thing. This is why you want ExpressVPN. You can load this on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer. I've loaded it on all my stuff. It works great. You can have up to three devices running at a time on your account. And it 
make sure that you create a secure tunnel between you and the outside world so that whatever's happening in the club, somebody's not there sniffing your traffic, seeing what you're doing, seeing your passwords, if they're being sent in the clear, none of that stuff can happen because ExpressVPN takes care of it for you in only one click. It secures and anonymizes your internet browsing, encrypts your data and hides your public IP. And you can do this for less than seven bucks a month. Yeah, it's the number one rated VPN service by TechRadar, and it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So for all those times that you're out there using public Wi-Fi and you want to keep hackers and other prying eyes away, you got to check out ExpressVPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash gig gab that's e x p r e s s vpn.com slash g i g g a b that way they know we sent you and you get your one year subscription by paying just for nine months of it that's how this deal works it's a great deal again you get three months free with your one year subscription expressvpn.com slash gig gab our thanks to ExpressVPN for coming on board and sponsoring the show and, and really offering this great service for, for all of us to use. So thanks to them. Great all company, right. great service. Yeah, it's been working great for me, truly. Oh. Yeah, I'm stoked. Uh, all right, I, my next one on the list is think about one thing we've talked a lot about this year and one thing I, I, you know, I've learned to be even more cognizant of is thinking about your sound, your tone, your volume how you sound and your instrument sounds in the room that you happen to be playing in, right? There's, there's so many factors and it's really easy to get stuck in like, Oh yeah, I've tuned up my snare drum. Exactly right. It sounds great in the studio or, you know, you got this guitar patch or whatever, and you got a, or maybe, maybe you got your, uh, your Kemper, you know, model or amp and you've got a thousand, the very expensive (laughs) thousand different patches. You probably are going to, underserve yourself if you use if you attempt to use all thousand of those in a gig right it's great to have a thousand different patches find the three that work and then think about how those sounds work in the room that you're going to be playing in that very night right like that's something we've talked about in many different ways here throughout the year and and it really like it can make such a difference you know especially like i i'm doing this this headwig gig guitar player showed up and uh, actually, both guitar players are using Line 6 pedals or footboards, I should say, that, that essentially do this, right? They control all their sounds and they're just playing into, um, actually, I think it's a, a K10 or something like that as their monitor wedge. And then the rest goes into the house. And it was fantastic because these guys both came in and were like, oh, yeah. And they're, you know, hitting their guitar and listening to how it sounds in the room. They're like, oh, OK, right. I got to tweak the EQ on this. It's like, man, it makes the band sound so much better When everybody is thinking about how to make their instruments sound good, not just in the room, but um, with the band, like you've got multiple guitar players or if if you have a keyboard player versus not having a keyboard player, you know, who's taking up what parts of the sonic space? How are you not? And it's not just your sound. It's how you play. Right. You know, do you need to crunch rhythm all the time? Well, if you're in a three piece probs, if you're in a five piece probs, not, you know, and uh and so those those are good lessons, I think. And I, and I, I I talk about guitar players, but I as a drummer, I think about this constantly. I bring no less than two snare drums, usually three, to any gig. Checking out different cymbals. I have one cymbal. In fact, for this this where my drums happen to be, I've played I don't know how many gigs in this in this particular building at Seacoast Rep. And I thought I had figured out like not only which drums but which cymbals worked. And, uh, and that's not just snare drum. It's like, which toms do I use? Do I use the birch toms? Do I use the mapex toms? And I'm using the birch toms, uh, cause they, they cut and they have a clearer tone without being too bombastic for anybody that cares. Uh, and I thought I'd figured out symbols and, uh, and our sound guy came. And so I didn't, wasn't thinking about it. You know, it was like, Oh, I just go on autopilot. I know what works in this room. Well, I've never set my drums up in this location. I am dead center stage. And there's a different thing over me because they build sets, you know, and this one crash symbol that I have is like, it's a dark symbol. It's usually really warm and it's just like biting is all get out. And it, you know, it's because of the placement of where I am in the room and what has happened in the room around me, you know, what's been built and all that stuff. So I had to change out the symbol 
And it, you know, it took somebody else telling me like, oh, hey, like what's going on with that? It's like, oh, oh yeah, you're right. I didn't even think about it. So you got it's a hard thing because if you thing. don't have a wireless, you know, like for a guitar player to go out and, you know, wireless and listen to your sound is, you know, about the only way you can do it. You can't have like a drummer. If you have somebody sit at your drums, yeah, there are you can hear on it. Your drums. Really? I, 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 yeah. Once he pointed it out, like I just wasn't, I was too like worried, frankly, worried about these songs that I didn't know, you know, and cr- coming in and trying to really get up to speed. So I wasn't really thinking about sound, but as soon as he said it, I hit that symbol. I was like, oh yeah, holy crap. You can hear it echo back to you. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have to mm-hmm. intentionally, you know, stop and think, I, I think. And, and I think with a guitar amp, I mean, you're far enough away from it. You, you know, you're 10 feet away, hopefully five feet, maybe. You know, you should, you know, with your chord, you can kind of listen or whatever. And like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a little harsh in here or whatever. And, you know, roll something off mm-hmm. or ask your bandmates, too. Right. I mean, yeah. like you can th- th- there should be a shared goal of everything sounding good. And and therefore, you know, your bandmates should be able to help tell you these things. Like, what do you think? Is that too? Is that am I, am I cutting through enough? Like with our in fling with our guitar players, we're constantly talking about, oh, yeah, yeah your lead volume needs to be louder in, in this room or whatever. And it's like, OK, you know, and, and share. Well, yeah, we're lucky we have a bill. So yeah. you know, we, we we typically leave uh, anything going into the audience to bill. So he'll tell the guitar is too loud, too harsh, yeah. too, you know, to anything. That's right. um, and we're responsible for what we want to feel on stage. And that that's we're fortunate to have a bill. So yep. that works out well for us. Yep. But you can make his job easier too, right? By but like like you said, by listening to him. If he says, "Oh, it's too yeah. harsh," oh, okay, I'm going to roll off some mids or whatever. Yeah, it's a team effort, and and really, I, I I think maybe that's the point is everybody just listen to each other and and help, you know, and and know that if somebody says, "Hey, your sound's too harsh," it's not a commentary on the way you've chosen to live your life for you know since you were born. It's just a commentary on how your instrument happens to sound in that room. You know, no offense, right? <laughs> It's like, that's just how it goes. I've had some cats that are like, oh, for man, sure. you know, no, this is my perfect sound. <laughs> no, not in here. It's not it, at home. Maybe that's cool. Yeah. But yeah, just Different not here. It's, diff- it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, there you go. All right. One more for you. And uh, this is a reflection that is probably sums up our whole 195 episodes on Gig Gab. And, and I send this out to, you know, the sweet spot of what I believe our listenership is, which is, you know, cover bands, you know, some club dates, some, some corporate dates, um, you know, some professionals in the band, some weekend warriors in the band. I think, uh, the, the biggest lesson, biggest reflection that I have from all the time that we've been doing gig gab, and it's come up so many times in the past year, certainly is that the best thing for a band is to be on the same page and be on the same page means a few different things, be on the same yeah. page about selection of of material who makes decisions where you're going to play how far you'll go to play and coalescing the same page and decision making whether that's you know starting out with something maybe written or expressed verbally here's how this band works if someone's auditioning to come into your band or you're forming a band are you a leader is it a democracy but the common communication you know in the same way that you were saying that you know it's not it's not a bad thing to have an agreement with with people who you're discussing gigs with that goes, I think triple for the people that you're going to have this enterprise with, whether again, it's you own the band and you're hiring other musicians. Is it clear what the decision-making process is? Who's choosing the material, what the pay rate, you know, maybe your pay rate is, you know, for 50 miles around here, we'll play for this for hundred miles. It's this, and that those are non-negotiable things, but the ability to make sure that your band is on the same page in as many, many realms as possible, I think is critical for long-term success. If you don't want to be repeating, replacing people on an ongoing basis, again, you know, they're, they're, this takes a, so, a few different forms. If, if your band's a democracy or a owned or leader led or that type of thing. But, but even at that, agree to that and, and understand that even in democracies, not everybody will speak up. And, right. you know, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, say, Hey man, this is your chance. And again, the, the, the wavering off of this, this, um, and I'm, I'm particularly terrible about this. When, when people waver off of an express agreement, I actually get offended and I get, you know, really frustrated. I'm not very good at calming everybody down saying, Hey guys, remember this is, we've already agreed to this or here's the way it is. Um, you know, I'm like, dude, we've been through this. You know, yeah. Like, we've already, why are we rehashing this? That's right. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's, that's human nature. I mean, you know, people will see that they can add something to something. You got to kind of find the good in, uh, if you've picked wisely and, and brought guys into your group that you can play with. And again, there's different, 
uh, you know, maybe it's a pro thing and you just want the best cats in town and your, your main social requirement is that they show up on time. You know, maybe that's all that you need from that's stuff. But for need. most that's of right. us, yeah. you know, for fling, for the house rockers, for most of us, we're trying to create uh, something we can live with, right? <laughs> How deep a family you're creating out of that is is really up to you. Some people just want to show up and play. Some people, you're so emotionally connected to what you're doing. It's such a big part of your identity that you want that to be an extension of your family or, or a version of your family, maybe. But um, having people on the same page in as many of the realms of, of band business and decision making as possible, I think is you know the, the biggest lesson from 195 episodes uh, of doing this together, um, you know, being clear, verbose, a very good communicator with your bandmates, setting expectations, people being on the same page will keep a band together more than anything else. Man, that's so true. That's really it is just, yeah, you got to communicate, but, but you also just need to be on the same page. That's right. And if you're not, uh, you need to fix that. And sometimes fixing that is just a conversation. And sometimes fixing that is changing harder personnel. Yeah, yeah, it's a harder conversation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um, and, you know, I, I was having this conversation with someone, uh, actually the guitar player in uh, in the Hedwig gig. He he's had his business. His He's been playing guitar forever and he's had some great stories. Actually, we should have him on. He's had some really interesting experiences in his life. But um. But he's also uh, the CEO of a, actually a fairly large company, not a public company, but a fairly large company that he's had for 20 years. And we were talking about how things change because one of my companies, Mac Observer, just hit 20 years on on Friday. And Congratulations. Thank buddy. you. But, you know, like you and I have had bands that are that have been around, you know, more than half that time, too. Right. Like the House Rockers is closing in on 20 years. And people change. People's needs change. People's interests change. Just as people, you know, every we go through our life experiences and we change and our desires change. And that is really reflected in the things that we do for ourselves. Right. Whereas, you know, and most of us as weekend warriors would probably I think it's fair to say that, you know, we do the, these gigs because we like it. And so a band that starts, you know, with one premise and keeps the same personnel all the way through, well, you're probably, you know, 10 years later, even five years later, you're probably going to have some things that have changed. And assuming that people will remain static uh, beings is dangerous because it's incorrect. And uh, and that doesn't make it easy. That kind of leads to all these conversations that you were talking about. But it's just the reality of it. So you got to keep embracing that reality. Yeah. yeah, that's the point. You got to keep having you know, like a state of the band, you know, yeah. meeting is is they're painful things. I know in my case, they're painful things. It sucks because what happens is those those evolutions of people's feelings that have been bottled up they all come out and they yeah. tend to come again how good a communicator are your co are your bandmates some of them this is you know just expressing their feelings that's a contentious act right yeah you know, that's just the way they are they're bottled up they're nervous about sharing what they have to share they're nervous about saying hey something's changed for me and i send nothing but love out to my the the band leader listeners that we have here because that is really that is the thing. It's social engineering. It's not just booking the band. It's not just, you know, musical directoring the band, but it's social engineering your band. And it's and it's oftentimes talking a guy off the ledge. It's oftentimes, you know, reminding people what your tacit agreement is in terms of decision making. Yeah, it's 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 having those, you know, finding a way to have it as a compassionate conversation. Hey, man, is, if this stuff has changed for you, that's cool. Let's just have that conversation. Maybe it's not the right thing anymore. It would be intensely painful for me and intensely painful for you. But let's, you know, let's not approach that as a, as a, you know, a contentious environment yeah. to have the conversation. If that's the reality, then that's you know, man, the reality. we've been playing music for X amount of years. You know, we have, you know, that doesn't change. No, no one can take that away right. from us. It's but, been you know, a good run. We may or may not have another good run in us. That's okay. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. That's it. And that's, that's kind of life. And as much as changing out musicians is painful and a lot of times they have cascading effects, like yeah, I said, the, I said the new but person love. you bring in is going to have their own desires. Right? I mean, it's, yep. you're, you're inheriting a new version of the same problem uh, when yep. you change bandmates. And sometimes that's like that's the, the, the best of the worst case scenario. Right. You know, is, is that. Uh, but, yeah, it's just how it goes. It's it's life and it's OK. So, 
Yeah. Value this value the same page, strive for the same page, and that will serve your band. You serve your band well. Yeah, I think so. Well, all right, how about some New Year's resolutions? Oh boy. Yeah, all right. What uh I I don't know that I I think I've kind of combined my my resolutions into my lessons, but uh but yeah, let's let's go. What what do you what do you well, got? Mine is, my, definitely for me, I have to be much harder on myself, demand a lot more with regards to, you know, memorizing lyrics and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. The the most useful thing we've shared is if in your mind you ever get to like good enough, I'll have it by the gig, you won't have it by the gig. You're done. <laughs> You're it. done. Your brain has already turned off the ability to learn and you know that type of thing. So you have to you have to really be diligent with yourself and you know when you have a barrier to something. And to me, I'm finding as I get older that lyrics are getting harder and harder and you know I the the, we talked about the various ways to do it. For me, once you commit it to a cheat sheet, you're in a lot of trouble. It's yeah. like your brain knows that the cheat sheet can be there and it doesn't want to learn it anymore. So for me, it's listening constantly, writing them over and over and over and That's over. That's the real so, trick. I, I've been finding that helpful is, yeah, because that just like not typing them, writing them. Yep. 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 And the whole thing about, uh, about the, you know, the first word of the line can often trigger the whole thing and, you know, experiment with that and see if it works for you. But yeah, that's my first resolution is to be much, much more critical of the bar that I've, I've allowed myself to set in terms of, uh, in terms of lyrics. So that, that would be number one. Yeah. For me, it's, it's, um, being ruthless with my time. And accepting that my time is the most valuable thing that I have to me, not necessarily to other people, but but to me and and really making sure that the time that I'm spending playing music is the time that I want to be spending playing music. Um, mm. uh, you, you know, like I because I've found myself in rehearsals, uh, you know, and it's like, man, what am I doing here? Like, this is a waste of time. And 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 I've I've actually said that, like, why are we why are we here? Like. I can play on my own anytime, but you know, usually rehearsals are happening at time that I would be trading for time with my family or whatever. And I just had, you know, my daughter went off to college. My son's going to go off in a year and a half or whatever. So they, like those realities are hitting me pretty hard that, that, you know, the, the, the way my life is, isn't the way it always will be. And I want to make sure that I'm spending my time doing the right things. I love playing music. I, I you know, I, I think it's pretty obvious that I can't stop. Uh, it's, it's my favorite addiction. I like to say, but, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it does take time. And, and so, uh, I've become, yeah, ruthless with my time, I think is, is, or being, being ruthless with my time is, is really kind of the trick. Like, all right, let's well, reasonable because it makes you a better, when you're there, you're present. You're, you know, if I want to be things present. that you really want to do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I don't, sense. I don't want to be there with my head somewhere else, but if I'm there and it's not productive time or, you know, if it's the seventh rehearsal for something that only needed two, it's like, okay, whoa, whoa. Like, and, and I realize that the, you know, the seventh rehearsal might be needed by someone else and I only needed to, well, what does that mean? Well, it probably means that I need to be very careful, you know, who I take the gigs with and how that goes. Right. I, I need to, I need to find people that are, that are in a similar scenario. Like, can we, can we do this the way we want to do it? With, you know, this much time preparing and that sort of thing. And, sure. You know, um, just being aware of that and very cognizant and communicative of that. So that's, yeah, that's, cool. that's, that's my big one. Yeah. How about you? Number you got two, more? Three yeah. for me. I got two more. I got uh, right. next one is I, I really want to be a better leader. So like I was alluding to, I'm a good leader. I think, you know, I kept a band together for 20 years. We work, yeah. you know, by and large people like it. But I really would like to smooth out the edges that give us bumps. You know, I have different guys who give me different bumps in different ways. And I need to continue to to refine, perfect the way you bring people back into the fold. And that, that's yeah. kind of what I see. I, you know, I, I have some guys who don't want to play on certain certain family occasions. Some guys who, you know question business decisions. And, you know, my, my response to them is, is more like, dude, I do all this work. Just do it. Right. And that's not really an effective leadership style. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I want to be better and better and better at, at meeting, uh, my bandmates. So I, I've trusted enough to have them be bandmates. I remember some of them over half of them have been with me more than 15 years. So, I mean, it is, it is a long time ongoing concern and I would like it to be another 20 years. Um, and the way I think we get to that again is it's not only the same page, 
but it's, it's how I um, hear their concerns, act on their concerns, you know, communicate what I'm willing to do. And it doesn't mean I have to do everything they ask, but you know, my response to them, if they, if they want something that I can't provide has got to be a little bit more um, thoughtful. And so focused on that human engineering part is actually a really big thing for me. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. What's your last one? All right. Check this out. I get this from my great friend, my friend of almost 20 years, Dave Hamilton gave me this as a nugget early on in our life. It's been in the back of my head since I've been playing guitar again, but this concept of using the time when I'm not on stage that I'm still on the clock and I should be interacting with the crowd. I get really lazy and I only go to the people I know. Okay. Thank them for coming, you know, and then all of a sudden the break is over and you know, then it's done. Uh, I still am a big believer that one of the keys to our band's success is the kind of, you know, that people connect to us and uh, we've been doing a long time. We're interesting. You know, we're a big band. We, you know, we sound different. And so we we're attracting people, but how do we really get their hearts and minds as opposed to just their bodies coming to a gig, you know, whatever the average number of times they'll come to a gig. And a lot of that is just making a connection. I, I really want to be better about, you know, shaking hands, thanking people for coming to gigs introducing myself. And again, you gave me this a long time ago. I was totally blind to the concept and you see it works a lot. I mean, I did it. We had a really big gig, this winery gig that we did a couple months ago. Um, we sold it out, you know, people paid a lot of money per ticket. Um, and we had a break and I said, I'm going to go do this. So I just went table to table and just said, Hey, I'm Paul from the band. Just want to thank you guys for coming. People just light up, you know, yeah. I, not that there's any celebrity factor to this all, but just nobody does that. Right. Just nobody, nobody says, Hey, we're all here to have a good time. I happen to be the guy on stage. You happen to be the people on the dance floor, but we're all just, you know, having a moment here. We're all just it's, humans. It's, yeah. It's just a really powerful thing. And it's something I just really want to be better at this year. Cool. Yeah. No, I, well, I, I mean, I'm with you. We could all be better about <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's not, um, it, yeah, it's, it can, it can feel natural to me, but starting that is not natural to me. Once I get going, once I'm in yeah. it, then it's, yes. then I'm, then I'm, I, I'm actually very good at it. I'm comfortable it's daunting, with it. daunting to get your, your motion going for that type of thing. Yeah. But once you see how it does connect with people, it actually is a very, very empowering, emboldening thing. It, yeah, exactly. Like once you, once you do the first one, it's like, oh wow, these people Ooh. love us, you know, but it's that, you know, it, it's that concept of you're picking up a rock. Is there a snake under it? You know, <laughs> like you don't know. And, and you will run into people that are total jerks about that stuff. And, and you just sort of have to brush that off. But by and large, people are there because they want to have a good time. As I always say, and it's sort of the same thing, you know, when you go watch a band on stage, it's different than watching a sporting event. No one, well, rarely, I'll say no one, but I know that there's exceptions. No one is there to watch someone lose, right? Everyone is there rooting for you to win, you know? And, and so like it, like everybody wants to see you succeed on stage. Exactly. And, and it's, it's good to remember that, you know, they're not there waiting for your mistake. They're there waiting for your moment to shine. And so what about the mistakes, you know, and that's, that's an important thing to remember. And especially when you're going up to, to, you know, talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's it. That's, yeah. that's my 2018 wrap up. Good. Cool. Well, yeah, same. Thanks folks uh, for a great, uh, another great year of gig gab. Um, thanks to our sponsor express VPN, of course, and, uh, make sure to visit expressvpn.com slash gig gab. That's uh, I think that's what I got. Is that what you got? My friend? That's what I got, man. Happy new year, Dave. Happy new year to you. Happy new year to everybody. It's, uh, and may we all enter 2019 always being performing. Yeah. I'll be entering 2019 that way. Whether I like it or not. <laughs> Have a good one, everybody. We'll see you next year, next week. Next week.